I do hope this video's title intrigues you. What do a king, an emperor and Madame Tussaud, the founder of the famous waxworks Madame Tussauds, have in common? Well, bizarrely, they have an item of ceremonial clothing in common. To be precise, the state or parliamentary robe of King George IV, commissioned for and worn at his coronation in July 1821. Now, before I get comments in the comments box, in England, for some reason, we pronounce Tussaud as Tussauds, as mispronouncing French words has a very long pedigree over here, making fun of the French and the French language was, in times past, a bit of a national pastime. But I digress. Let's start by talking about George IV. He was an odd character and was not, to put it mildly, one of Great Britain's most popular sovereigns. He was lampooned by the cartoonists of his day as vainglorious, gluttonous, a drunkard and a man of low moral standing. In truth, he could also be very generous, and he was in many respects a cultured and sophisticated man. He was also fashion conscious, and was aware of the power of clothing to express personal image. Whether he had good judgement in the image he chose to project and cultivate is open to debate. He had a bit of a knack for making himself look downright silly. After reigning, to all intents and purposes, for nine years as the Prince Regent on behalf of his often incapacitated father George III, in 1820 his father died and George, at the age of 57, became king. His reign began on a high for Britain as it was only five years after the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte. After the Treaty of Paris, reparations were pouring into Britain from France and the image-conscious king made it clear that he thought that some of that cash should be splashed on making his coronation the most splendid spectacle in British history, a coronation worthy of Britain's role in the rescue of Europe from Bonaparte and of a victorious and conquering hero, which George imagined himself to be. Originally scheduled to take place in June of 1820, the little problem of George still being married to Carolina Brunswick, a woman he loathed, resulted in a postponement of the ceremony until the 19th of July 1821. The coronation was indeed the most expensive ever, and in George's eyes it was a grand jamboree of one-upmanship, for George had in mind that his coronation would outdo in splendour the imperial coronation of Napoleon at Notre Dame in 1804. In truth, it was ridiculously over the top and almost a parody of a coronation. Although George liked wearing uniforms, he was not the great conquering military hero he imagined. He was middle-aged and out of shape, and his corpulent form, wearing an auburn wig and dressed up like a peacock, puffing and panting around Westminster Abbey while attended by people in Elizabethan costume, gave the whole affair the air of grand farce or pantomime rather than splendour and solemnity. Although George IV seemingly detested Napoleon Bonaparte, the upstart emperor of the French, it also appears that George in some way admired him and was fascinated, perhaps even obsessed with him. When Napoleon's reign ended for a second time after the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 and he was then exiled to St Helena, George set about collecting as many of Napoleon's possessions as he could get his hands on. Between 1815 and his death in 1830, George collected many items of furniture, weapons, silver and even clothes belonging to the defeated French emperor, which he surrounded himself with in Carlton House, his London residence. His obsession went one further. When it came to his coronation robes, he decided that he would dress as Napoleon dressed at his coronation. And a tailor was sent by George to Notre Dame in Paris to take measurements of Napoleon's coronation robe. And George's state or parliamentary robe was based on it. Of course, as the great victorious hero, George IV's robe was to be even more lavish than his arch enemies. No expense was spared on this garment. It was made of crimson velvet with swathes of gold embroidery on nearly every inch of it, 
and it cost the staggering sum of £24,000 in 1821, around a million and a half in modern money. Now, we know the full form of both Napoleon and George's robes from the evidence of paintings and other illustrations. Several paintings were made in 1804 or in the years after that show Napoleon dressed in his coronation robes. Similarly, we have the official state portrait by Sir Thomas Lawrence of 1821 that shows George IV dressed in his state robe, and also the evidence of engravings in John Whittaker's lavish folio, the ceremonial of the coronation of his most sacred majesty, King George IV. There is a fabulous engraving in that book that shows the king dressed in the robe, making his way from the Palace of Westminster to the Abbey to be crowned. The form of George's robe was almost identical to Napoleon's, and it broke from existing British tradition. English king's robes had come down from the Middle Ages, almost unchanged, and are exemplified by the robe of state of George's father, George III. They were open at the front and closed with a clasp at the chest, and the robe and its train were all of one piece. They were trimmed with ermine and miniver, but the train was very simply decorated with three rows of gold lace. The robes of Napoleon and George IV are of a different form entirely. Rather than being open at the front, they have a large flap, or swag, that hangs down nearly to the floor. Over this is a cape of fur, and then a train uh, hanging from the shoulders. The velvet ground of Napoleon's robe is decorated with embroidered bees, a symbol he'd borrowed from the Merovingian kings of the early Middle Ages. And on George's version, these were substituted with the symbols of England, Scotland and Ireland, the rose, the thistle and the shamrock. The thick gold embroidered border of Napoleon's robe incorporated rather modestly his initial N, on George's version, these were substituted with the British crown set within a wreath of victory and surrounded by other symbols of victory and military prowess. A very unsubtle dig at the defeated and exiled French emperor. The 27-foot long train of George's robe was longer than that of Napoleon and of any British king before him. It was 10 feet longer than the train of his father's robe and it was so heavy that it had to be borne by eight peers of the realm. Now, at his coronation, Napoleon had worn over his robe the collar of the Grand Master of the Legion d'Honneur, the only chivalric order in France at that time. Now, it had been traditional for British kings to wear the collar of the Order of the Garter over their robe at coronations, and that is, of course, the uh, current custom. However, to out-swagger Napoleon again, George was weighed down with four, perhaps even five, collars over his robe. In the illustration from Whittaker, he appears to be wearing the collars of the Orders of the Golden Fleece, of the Royal Guelphic Order, the Order of the Bath, the Order of the Thistle, and the Order of the Garter. He was sovereign of four of these orders and the founder of one, he founded the Royal Guelphic Order, a Hanoverian order, in 1815 when he was Prince Regent. George was made a knight of the Austrian branch of the Order of the Golden Fleece in 1814. Wearing that foreign order was a dig at Napoleon too, as had Napoleon had his way, he would have been sovereign over it. His brother was sovereign of the Spanish branch of the order for a time. In the coronation portrait of George IV, painted by Sir Thomas Lawrence, not only is George dressed in his Napoleon-esque robe, is that a word, or have I just invented it, there is a further dig at Napoleon. George is, is standing beside a piece of furniture that once belonged to the French Emperor. Stuffed with its hired diamonds, George's ridiculous coronation crown is shown sitting on a small table. And this table has significance. It is called the Table of the Great Commanders of Antiquity and it was commissioned in 1806 by Napoleon to immortalise his reign. It has a Sèvres porcelain top and in the centre is an image of Alexander the Great made to look like Napoleon and around it are heads of 12 great commanders from the ancient world including Pericles, Scipio, Pompey, Augustus, Septimus Severus, Constantine Trajan, etc, etc, etc. 
The implication is clear that Bonaparte is as great a military leader as these, which, to be frank, is probably a fair assessment of his achievements. George IV was given this table that meant so much to Napoleon by Louis XVIII, and he treasured it. So here is George portrayed as an improved version of Napoleon, resting his finger upon this table. There is no question that the placement of his crown on the table directly over the bust of Napoleon as Alexander is intentional. George is being presented here as the real member of this august company and Napoleon is now an irrelevance. It must have been galling for George, having gone to so much effort to outdo Napoleon, that Napoleon died in exile on St Helena a little over two months before the coronation in 1821. In 1830, when George IV died rather unlamented by his country, his brother, King William IV, had no intention of wearing such a ridiculous outfit for his coronation. The coronation of 1821 had been lavish. That of 1831 was dubbed a half-crown nation. Economy and simplicity was the order of the day. And William returned to the traditional form of the British robe of state in preference to his brother's novel design. He may even have reused his father's robe of 1761. Through the offices of George IV's executor, the Duke of Wellington, the state robe of George IV was subsequently sold in the 1830s to Madame Marie Tussaud for her famous waxwork exhibition. A wax figure of George IV wearing his original state robe and standing by a canopied throne was a prominent exhibit within the Baker Street Bazaar where Madame Tussaud established her exhibition permanently in 1835. You can see George's figure wearing the robe in this engraving from 1842. The figure remained on display for many years and it was later dressed in the robes of the Order of the Garter. When a fire devastated the exhibition in 1925, the figure was badly damaged, but by then the robe was in store. And it's still in the collection of Madame Tussauds and was recently brought out and lent to Brighton Pavilion for an exhibition celebrating George's flamboyant style. It seems rather fitting that this over-the-top robe made for such a flamboyant king should end up as a sideshow exhibit. Thanks very much for watching.